Good evening, everybody. Hello and welcome to the My Efficient Electric Home Switching Off Fossil Fuels event presented as part of the Sustainable Living Festival. Uh, my name is Kalia Colston. I'm a broadcaster and a climate advocate and a past editor of Sanctuary Magazine. I'm also a longtime member and huge fan of the My Efficient Electric Home Facebook group. And so I'm delighted to be your host this evening. Tonight, for well, the first time ever, all three of the My Efficient Electric Home admin team will be together in conversation and presenting to you. Feels like a rock star moment, it is. Uh, first though, let us begin by acknowledging the traditional owners of the lands from which each of us are dialing in today. My Efficient Electric Home and the Sustainable Living Festival acknowledge the traditional Castonians of country throughout Australia and their connections to land, sea and community. We pay our respect to their elders past, present and emerging and extend that respect to all Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander peoples today. They are our first scientists, our first engineers and have lived sustainably in our challenging environments for more than 65,000 years. This evening, we're going to hear how you can improve your home, save money and get off fossil fuels. Uh, the best available science says the world needs to reach net zero greenhouse gas emissions by mid-century. That's to keep global temperatures from increasing by more than one and a half degrees and avoid the worst impacts of climate change. Yes, this requires step changes in the way we generate and consume energy in Australia and globally, but there is still much we can each do within our own homes and communities that is smart and satisfying. The My Efficient Electric Home community on Facebook has nearly 25,000 members and counting and over five years it's helped any number of people achieve their home efficiency goals and in that time has become the leading database of information dedicated to helping improve the comfort and energy performance of Australian homes. This evening, over the next hour and a bit, and I can see more people are joining us, welcome. All three of the folks behind My Efficient Electric Home will be presenting to you for about 15 to 20 minutes each. Tim Forsey, among many other things, assists individual Victorian homeowners as a home comfort and energy advisor. Jenny Edwards is a building scientist with Lighthouse Architecture and Science. Richard Keach is an engineer, consultant and author of the Energy Freedom Home. We'll be taking your questions at the end. Um, we've allowed the better part of an hour for that. Um, but if a burning question pops into your head, um, mind the pun, there's no burning on my efficient electric home, um, but please add your burning question to the Q&A below and I'll do my best to bring your questions into the discussion. We're, we're probably going to finish around 8.30 local time, so that's in about an hour and a half. Um, but first up, let me introduce you to Tim Forsey. Um, Tim is an experienced home comfort and energy advisor who will speak about how the remarkable group um, that is likely you're part of, and if not, you can join, um, is called My Efficient Electric Home and how it came to be and why getting off gas is so important. Uh, over to you, Tim. Okay, thank you very much. Can you hear me? Loud yeah. and clear. And can you see the slides? <clears throat> How's that? Are the slides there? Hope so. <laughs> okay, thank you and uh, welcome everyone for coming along this evening. Uh, thanks, Kalia, for that introduction and thanks for the all good, good work that you've been done, doing over the years with Sanctuary Magazine and now as communications lead at Climate Works Australia. And thanks especially for being our MC this evening. Thanks also to the National Sustainable Living Festival for the opportunity to present this webinar. And I'd also like to thank my volunteer co-admins at the Facebook group, My Efficient Electric Home, that's Jenny Edwards and Richard Keach, whose presentations will follow mine. Jenny and Richard, your inexhaustible enthusiasm for helping people has just been so inspiring to me. And the same thanks goes out to our nearly 25,000 members at My Fish and Electric Home, members who every hour of every day and night are busy helping each other to improve their homes. And thanks to all of you who've tuned in on to uh, tonight. And if we manage to record this, uh, a further thanks to all those people that will watch it in the future. So I trust everyone tonight will be rewarded. In my part tonight, I'll describe about how this Facebook group came to be. See, there was a story to be told revealed by research we published at the University of Melbourne and also described by organizations such as Beyond Zero Emissions and Renew, a story about how useful and economical reverse cycle air conditioners, heat pumps can be 
in Australian homes for heating and cooling our living spaces and also for heating our water. A story of how Australians can save a lot of money and reduce their climate and environmental impact by setting their homes up to be efficient and all electric and needing to burn no gas, no LPG and not even any wood. So tonight I'll again tell that story and I'll also mention why fossil gas is no longer the cheap and less dirty fuel we thought it was. And lastly, I'll say why we should not delay electrifying our homes, waiting around for green hydrogen to arrive at our door. So let's go. Back in and before 2013, Richard Keach and I and others contributed to the Beyond Zero Emissions Buildings Plan, a report that showed how Australia could cost effectively decarbonize the entire building sector. Basically, Australians burn over three and a half billion dollars, that's three and a half billion dollars worth of gas every year in our homes and other buildings. And we don't have to do that anymore. We shouldn't be doing it anymore because today we have cheaper options. Decarbonizing our building sector and reducing this massive economic waste is a big opportunity and a good news story. But even after the work of Beyond Zero Emissions and others, the word was still not getting out to the entire community of gas users, as it must. So a couple of years later in 2015, when I was working at the University of Melbourne Energy Institute, we had the opportunity to describe in more detail just how much money an individual homeowner or renter in Melbourne or in Canberra could save simply by finding the heat button on their air conditioner. What we found was some of the lowest hanging fruit around for people to save money on their household budgets to decarbonize and even to make their homes healthier and safer. As you see reported here in these articles in the Age newspaper and by the ABC, a large Melbourne home could save $658 each winter by heating with an air conditioner instead of gas. And a home in Canberra could save even more than that, up to $1,700 a year. And in many cases, in those millions of Australian homes where people have already purchased reverse cycle air conditioners, there's zero upfront cost. You already have what you need. <clears throat> because folks already in that quest for summer cooling bought the air conditioner. So the trick is letting all these people know that hanging right there on the wall is the cheapest way to heat your house. Across Victoria, for example, we found that $250 million per year could be saved by people who already have air conditioners in their homes, but they've never used them for winter heating. So of course I had to follow my own advice on this, so at our home in Bayside, Melbourne, we too, like so many Australian homes, had recently installed a couple of air conditioners for summer cooling, but then we went on to use them for winter heating at a cost one third of what we were spending on the ducted gas heating. And I described that in that article there, Comfortably Ahead, A Tale of Two Heaters, published in Renew Magazine. And here you see the back of my house where we now heat and cool our living spaces with heat pumps, reverse cycle air conditioners, and we also heat our water with what is basically another reverse cycle air conditioner, an air source heat pump. So we got a bit more media attention with our University of Melbourne work, but still not enough people were hearing the message often enough to combat the gas industry with their spin on the radio ads or to overturn the advice of plumbers who really, they're just keen to install whatever old gas equipment they have on their truck. So I was thinking how to keep spreading the word, what else to do? And my kids came up to me and said, you know, dad, there is this thing called social media. So with a bit of trepidation, I signed up to Facebook and here we are today. I launched my efficient electric home. In our first year, we reached 200 people and we had 200 members, but now uh, we've got 200 people joining every single week and we're now right around 25,000 members. So what do our members do? Well, they ask questions because they're designing a new home or they're renovating or their hot water service just died or they have three quotes for solar panels but they don't know if any of them are any good or there's a lot of condensation on their windows in, in the morning and winter or do whirly birds actually do any good for cooling your roof space? So we get an endless stream of questions, sometimes repetitive, by no means uh, not just about uh, where we started with the heat pumps but as you can imagine, every question imaginable about operating a home efficiently right down to the energy efficient doggy doors. And without fail, the endless questions are followed by an endless stream of answers as our members volunteer their time and expertise trying to help out. So back to the air conditioners, what do our members say? Are they finding the results like we foretold at Melbourne Uni? Indeed they are, as you can read here. 
I'll read one of them. Jackie writes, we used our reverse psycho air conditioner this winter in Canberra. Worked great and we're on track to save $1,100 on heating costs compared to last year on gas. Very happy. That's from Jackie. So without further ado, how can you do this? How can you save on winter heating? Well, space heating choices. In your home, you might have more than one option. You might have two or three. Do you choose to heat your home with a gas heating system? Or will you use those simple electric resistive heaters, the panel heaters, the oil column heaters, the fan heaters, the heat lamps? Those are all, they all use electricity just to heat wires in one way or another, just like a toaster. Or, but there is the third choice. Will you find the heat button on your reverse cycle air conditioner should you happen to have one? Which of these three ways to heat is the best? Which is the cheapest to run? And beyond operating costs, is there anything else to consider? <clears throat> Well, let's start with the reverse cycle air conditioner. I don't know if you have one of these in your home today, but if you don't yet, you will in future because this is how most of us will be heating our homes eventually and cooling them too, of course, as our earth gets hotter and hotter. It is now really important from a home energy point of view in Australia that people have some understanding of how these things work. Forget about gas and in many places even forget about evaporative cooling. Reverse cycle air conditioners are the future of home heating and cooling for most Australian homes. Not all air cons look like the standard what you'd call split system mounted up on the wall. Some models can be mounted down on the floor. Some can be hidden in bulkheads. Some of them use air ducts, but many don't. But with the basic unit, there are the two parts, the inside part and the outside part. There are no air ducts connecting these two parts of a split system. Rather, they're connected by small diameter copper piping carrying refrigerant around in a cycle. So this device is sort of like a refrigerator in that it doesn't create heat so much as it just moves it or pumps it from one place to another. Beyond mainland Australia, these things are called heat pumps. Throughout the US, US Europe, New Zealand, Tasmania, they call them heat pumps. For sure, you already use one type of heat pump in your home, and that's your refrigerator. It uses a refrigerant system to pump the heat that is trying to get into your food, inside your fridge. Your heat pump pumps that heat back out into your kitchen. Similarly, an aircon in summer pumps heat from your lounge room to outside of your house. But in winter, operating in reverse cycle, an aircon does just the opposite. It collects free renewable heat from the air outside your home, even if it's only a few degrees Celsius outside, no problem. There is still heat in our air that the sun put there that a modern reverse cycle air conditioner can collect and pump up to the temperature suitable for then heating your home. I mentioned free heat, and one nice thing about free heat is that it's free. No one can bill you for it. Thus, a reverse cycle air conditioner can be the lowest cost way to heat your home. <clears throat> The leveraging effect of a heat pump and the way it collects free heat from the air outside means that it can be said to be 400, 500, 600% efficient. In other words, for every one unit of electricity you have to pay for to drive the compressor and the fans in, in that equipment, uh, you get up to four, five, or six units of heat coming out of it. So the bottom line, reverse cycle air cons can heat your house for as little as around one fifth of what it might cost you to heat with these resistive electric heaters. As an energy advisor, this is about the easiest win I can find for a client when I see in the very same room uh, an electric panel heater being used for uh, heating, chewing up electricity five times as fast as the reverse cycle air conditioner that's present in the very same room. Now to someone from outer space, this seems crazy. A person choosing to use a heating system that costs five times as much. But of course, Australians buy air cons for summer cooling. And once the weather cools off, People put away the remote control and they never think about the air conditioner again until next summer. But what about compared with gas heating? Isn't gas cheap? Versus gas heating, heating with your air conditioner might cost you only one third of what it costs to heat with gas. At least that's exactly what we found in our home. We stopped heating with ducted gas and instead now heat with two split systems, one at either end of the house for just a third of what it used to cost us to heat with gas. And should you be lucky enough, to have a suitable roof and solar PV panels on that roof using a reverse cycle air conditioner powered by those solar panels when the sun is shining, well, that can be the cheapest heating and cooling uh, going around. And another thing to remember about gas is that it's not just about the money. <clears throat> Victorians have died because they've been poisoned by deadly carbon monoxide gas coming from poorly maintained or poorly operated or just very old gas heaters. If you have a gas heater, you should have it professionally checked every two years 
and this will include a carbon monoxide check. If the gas heater you have looks rather ancient, then it might be time for an upgrade and upgrade to an air conditioner, of course, not to another gas heater. Air source heat pumps aren't only used for heating living spaces, they're also used to heat water. And given the renewable energy credits and rebates on offer when you switch over to heating your water with a heat pump, this can be a clean and cost-effective way to heat your water. Clearly, there's money to be saved if your home is not at all connected to the gas grid. No daily gas grid connection charges, no gas burned, and therefore no gas bill. So we have, among our 25,000 members at My Fish and Electric Home, uh, people seeing the savings of the gas-free home and getting rid of their gas meters altogether. Need room for another shrubbery? There you go. So now a couple of other things I'd like to talk about. Uh, first, let's see, is gas that clean green trans transition fuel that the gas industry says it is? Well, no, fossil fuel isn't a clean fuel, and in fact, it might be the dirtiest fuel. We've probably seen all the aerial photos of the coal seam gas wells in Queensland, but this image came up at another webinar, so I grabbed a screenshot. Over 10,000 coal seam gas wells have been drilled already in Queensland and New South Wales, and over 40,000, heck, who knows, maybe 100,000 more will be drilled if the gas-happy Australian government and, and other irresponsible parties get their way. To the eye, these wells look damaging enough, but what can't we see in this photo? What's going on beneath the farmland and up in our atmosphere? There are people living amongst all this gas industry infrastructure. They try to raise families to farm, run businesses amid all of that gas activity, or at least they used to. Many people have left got out. Some of them have been paid by the gas industry to leave. Lots of things are chasing people out of their homes up there, impacts on their water supplies, noise, disruption of the lifestyle they thought they had. Here is a recent report about some of the more obvious gas just bubbling up out of the ground again in Queensland uh, in the coal seam gas fields in August 2020, just as we saw seven years ago back in 2013. See, a first step is for the gas miners is they pump all the water out of the coal seams and that allows the gas to flow. Some of the gas flows into their wells, but other gas can also go on its own way and just bubble up out of the earth. So a lot of that powerful greenhouse gas methane ends up in our atmosphere. More and more data is coming in from around the world about how poor a job the oil and gas industry does containing this methane. Using satellites, airplanes, drones, and now drive-by detectors, Researchers and some community groups are working to expose what's going on with this invisible gas and this underregulated polluting industry. Here are some images of me in the Queensland coal seam gas fields with an ABC journalist and also with a special $130,000 military grade infrared camera capable of seeing the release of methane gas that is otherwise invisible to the naked eye. The fossil gas industry says their product is clean without bothering to measure or report these emissions of methane and other contaminants, methane being a greenhouse gas that is ton for ton, many times more damaging even than carbon dioxide. So if you'd like me to tell you what is the greenhouse gas footprint of fossil gas, sorry, no one can tell you that because no one is keeping track. The only figures we have, you guessed it, come from the gas industry. Over in the USA, where they now have like 2 million unconventional oil and gas wells, it's so bad that they can see the uh, methane hotspots hot from space with a satellite. And here again, using methane sensing infrared technology, we see thousands of gas leaks across the street of Boston. If you walk down the street and smell gas, this is what's going on. Fossil gas is hardly a clean fuel. I suppose the best thing about gas is that it's invisible. If you could see it, you wouldn't use it. And actually, I suppose now I can delete this Boston slide because in the last few months, We've had articles in The Age and Sydney Morning Herald about methane releases on the streets of Melbourne and Sydney. It's a very common situation. So that's enough about fossil gas. And with all this, you'd think the gas industry would just give up trying to supply us these fuels of dubious origin. But uh, now get ready for hydrogen. Will you someday be heating your home by burning hydrogen? <clears throat> Today, we don't use hydrogen for too many things. The hydrogen is uh, these days is mainly made not from re renewables, but mostly from fossil gas. By the oil refinery industry, they use it for upgrading crude oil to petrol and other products, as you can see on the left of this slide. Hydrogen, again made predominantly from fossil gas, is also used by the petrochemical industry as an intermediate in the manufacture of chemicals such as ammonia and in the manufacture of fertilizers, explosives, and other chemicals. 
And phosphor hydrogen is also used in metals refining, such as upgrading iron ore. But looking beyond fossil fuels, it is also possible to make hydrogen from electricity and water, as some of us did in chemistry class, with the byproduct being oxygen. Making so-called green hydrogen from renewable electricity is done in a limited way today, but with there being no tax on carbon emissions, it's not a very economic proposition. Still, in our green energy future, renewable hydrogen could replace fossil hydrogen, and beyond that, renewable hydrogen could also be used as an energy carrier, a way to turn renewable electricity into a physical chemical that is then used in heavy transport or stored and used at critical times to make electricity. So those are the good future uses of hydrogen. But of course, with any good thing, there will be darker forces trying to latch onto the coattails of that good thing. And that's what these foreign owned companies that own the gas pipes that run down your street are up to. All across Australia, every distributor of fossil gas has received some taxpayer money to trial adding hydrogen to the gas grid. Why? Already gas is too expensive to burn and no one is saying hydrogen will be any cheaper to burn than gas. And no one, including the CSIRO, is saying hydrogen can ever compete economically with heat pumps. Suggesting that we are going to want to heat our homes by burning hydrogen is absurd. Because versus using a heat pump for heating, you would need six times as much electricity to make hydrogen that you would then burn in your house versus just turning on your air conditioner and letting it do the work collecting free renewable heat from the air outside your house. In future, we might have a lot of renewable electricity but we're not going to want to waste six times as much as we need to just to heat our homes. So what's all this hydrogen hype about then? Well, if you're a fossil gas producer or distributor, you don't want to talk about eventually closing down your industry. That would wreak havoc on the company's share price and on executive bonuses. So the gas industry and their lobbyists are talking to your local council. They're talking to anyone they can find saying, ignore these people at my efficient electric home. They're crazy. Um, they're saying, don't help people switch their homes and other buildings off gas. They're telling people, just wait, 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 and someday we'll be able to supply you with expensive hydrogen. That's their strategy. Be wary of it. But in the meantime, don't wait around for what I call golden hydrogen for the rich and famous to come down the pipes in your street. Just go ahead and get your home off gas, as we are doing at my efficient electric home. That's it for me for now. Back to you, Kalia. Hey, thanks, Tim. Um, and yeah, thanks so much for all the time and the volunteer effort that you put in and all the expertise that you share with us and have done over many years on My Efficient Electric Home. Um, if you have a question for Tim, the Q&A at the bottom of your screen is open. Uh, so just pop it in there and we're going to come to all of the questions at the end. Uh, and so just after eight o'clock local time here, so in about half an hour or so. Um, but next up, we have Jenny Edwards. Uh, she is a building scientist with Lighthouse Architecture and Science, and she's going to focus on renovating and retrofitting existing homes, only one of my most favourite topics. Take it away, Jenny. Thank you. Thank you very much, Kalia, and thanks, Tim, for that great start. Um, I just want to mention, I think I'm the only one who's presenting um, from outside of Victoria today. I'm actually living in Canberra, and I'm presenting from Canberra today um, on Ngunnawal, or from Ngunnawal land. Um, but I will share my slides and get cracking. Oh, let me go back to the start. Okay, so as um, Carly mentioned, I'm from Lighthouse Architecture and Science. Um, and that causes a little bit of confusion at times. People aren't used to science being integrated with architecture. Um, and most people assume I'm an architect. I'm not an architect. I'm also not an engineer. I like to think of myself as the rose between two thorns tonight. I'm the scientist um, between the two engineers. But I'm a scientist who owns an architecture practice and I think it's really important to integrate the two. I think most people when they see architecture imagine new homes and fa very fancy homes and big budgets. That's not what I'm about. Um, I'm really interested in smaller, smarter, sustainable housing and 75% of our work is actually renovation and retrofit. So tonight I'm going to talk about um, five case studies briefly um, and I'm just going to boil down the building science um, pretty succinctly um, but I'm happy to take lots of questions at the end. 
A uh, little bit more history. I've been in this game uh, since 2008. Um, and these are the evolutions uh, or the different names of my different companies as they progressed. Um, started out doing thermal imaging and air leakage testing and then um, ended up in the architecture side of things. But it's not just me. So I have a team of 16 um, really talented um, team members. 11 of them are on the design side of things, so quite a few architects. And then there are five of us on the building admin and science side of things. Uh, now, to boiling down the building science. These are really the three, three steps if you want to integrate some science um, and maximise the thermal performance of your building envelope, which I really encourage you to do. So first of all, number one is design it right. Um, and that, again, when people hear design it right, they think of a, the new build, but you can also design your renovation well. Um, you can optimise things at the design stage. Then you want to build it well, of course, and then you need to test that it works. And that's what I've done a lot of over the last decade. So designing it right, how do we do that? Um, well, the method I use um, is using what we call energy efficiency rating software, or in particular, the NATHERS um, software, the Nationwide House Energy Rating Scheme. Now this software is a great tool, really underutilised and misunderstood in Australia, um, developed and maintained by CSR, CSIRO. Great potential. Um, it really should be used as a design tool, that's how it was intended to be used, but instead, sadly, it tends to be used as a regulatory tool at the end of the design process. Um, I encourage people um, to integrate um, some NATO's modelling early in the design process. This, is, this slide just shows you an example of that. We use it for, this one is a new build, but I'll show you some reno, renovation examples in a minute. Um, we model up the house, um, the exact construction, the installation levels, the window types, the E offsets and projections, you name it. It's um, very detailed modelling and allows us to look at the predicted heating and cooling load for a house overall, but also zone by zone. Again, this is something that a lot of people don't know that you can actually look at how each zone is performing. So the heating and cooling load of each predicted room in the house. So you can really check that the whole house is gonna perform well. And we do this at every design, um, every stage of the design process. Building it well, clearly you need to work with a good builder, um, but there are, think, there are plenty of good builders out there. I've written an article uh, about how to help you find a good builder. Um, but how do we know that people build it well? Um, because there are ways to test um, that the house is working as intended. How do we do that? Um, thermal imaging, you can see a thermal camera there on the left, um, is a great tool for checking for gaps in insulation. They show up very quickly on this slide. Um, you can see this is on a hot summer's day. This, oh, this is a very old slide, back in 2008. Um, this is a very expensive renovation in a posh suburb. Um, this is the master bedroom and the owners couldn't understand why the house was still incredibly hot. And it turned out um, that there was a bag of bats sitting there and there were no bats in the rest of the roof. Anyway, 5% gaps in your insulation can, um, R5 insulation, it reduces its effectiveness by half. Fill those gaps. Air leakage testing. This is a blower door. You might've seen it on grand designs or heard about them. Um, air leakage testing is really useful. Australian housing is very leaky by international standards and draft sealing is one of the biggest bang for buck things you can um, possibly do in your home. Okay, um, before I get into the case studies, um, in fact, this house is a case study, but to show you that I walk the, um, walk the talk, not just talk it, this is my own home that was renovated back in 2011. Started out in incredibly uncomfortable and inefficient home. Um, we renovated it up to seven and a half stars. And it's the case study in the Your Home Guide. I encourage everybody to check out the Your Home Guide by the federal government. It's about to be updated. And my new house is actually gonna be the case study house in that one. This is my new house. Um, I will get into the case studies, but I wanna direct you to a couple of other presentations I've done recently. There's a good one um, I did with Sanctuary at the start of the pandemic, which is about my home. So I'm not gonna talk about that tonight. Um, there's also a terrific one I did with Renew early last year, specifically about retrofitting um, older homes. So I go into a lot more detail on a couple of houses that I'll mention tonight. There's also a lot of, uh, a lot of examples of renovation extensions. And on our journal page, there's a lot more um, 
information as well. And one more, the CSIRO last year um, asked me to do a renovating and retrofitting for sustainability webinar, and that is also available online. But this is a new case study that hasn't appeared in any of those presentations. This little project is called the Little Loft House, and it was completed last May. So we used thermal performance modelling to optimise things. We did a very small extension. So one thing, again, I always encourage people is to go for smaller and smarter homes. So um, a very small extension of 13 square metres. Um, you can see the lovely heat pump, hot water heat pump, heat pump for um, heating and cooling. Um, and there's also an induction cooktop inside. Um, so they went fully electric. That tells you a little bit more about it. So it ended up with a, a national star rating or EER of 7.7 .7 stars, having started at 3.8. These old houses do have potential. Um, there's an aerial view of it. It did have great orientation on its side, which you can see there. Um, the living areas already um, had some good northerly access. Um, solar diagrams, an aerial view, and there's the completed. Um, project but now oh thermal performance modeling again to show you that we did that nothing um, crazy was done in this house we topped up the ceiling insulation to r5 we retrofitted r2.5 insulation to the walls uh, the glazing was upgraded to pvc double glazing um, we put ceiling fans um, in all the living areas and bedrooms um, and deciduous shading was installed on a pergola out here um, and the eaves do the job on the other uh, north facing windows. So nothing, nothing out of the, um, nothing, oops. Oh, and of course we came in and we thermal imaged and we air leakage tested as part of the process. So when we um, do these projects, we come in and check that the insulation has been installed thoroughly and we check that the building envelope has been sealed very well. Well, the results, these are hot off the press. I only received these last week, but um, the clients, um, last year, in the July to October quarter, after moving in, uh, no, sorry, before moving in, this is the year before the renovation project, they were consuming 40.4 kilowatt hours per day. So that was, a lot of that was their gas consumption. Um, this year, no, last year, after moving in, when they'd gone all electric, their average daily consumption had dropped to 16.9 kilowatt hours per day. So that's a 58% reduction in their total energy consumption for a bigger house. And of course, their comfort levels have improved out of this world too. They um, are staggered by um, how comfy this site, literally, you know, pretty much the same old house. There wasn't a huge amount of um, rejigging done inside, um, but a massively uh, improved home. So another one, another case study, I'll keep moving along, is this one is actually a group of case studies that I did for the ACT government. And these were really tight budget projects. So between $500 and $2,000 for most of these houses. So 11 low income households. And um, the summary slide shows you that in the first winter, after some pretty basic measures, we, on average, the houses were saving uh, $270 on their winter energy bills. Of course, these numbers will be a lot bigger now. This is back in, uh, 2012, um, $90, uh, $95 over the autumn quarter. So significant savings, but more importantly, well, just as importantly, these people were, were reporting that they were so much more comfortable in their homes and their quality of life had improved. Uh, again, we used uh, thermal performance simulation, so the EER modeling to look at each house. Every house is different in the orientation varies, the insulation, the glazing sizes and things. So the houses had different potential. So we had, pre I predicted what we could achieve with some basic retrofitting measures, and then we compared to the actual. Some of them were right on. Some did much better than predicted. Others uh, did not very well at all because the uh, makeup of the household changed quite a bit and behavioral uh, stuff can have a big impact. But if we look at that case study number four quickly in more detail, it shows that the house started at 2.9 stars. Um, what I want to show is that with some really basic measures, some draft ceiling, some, um, actually the new blinds are no good, some wall insulation in this case, um, 
uh, gave a big benefit. But just focusing on topping up the ceiling insulation to R4, filling gaps, all those things combined can get the house up to 4.7 stars, um, which is a 41% reduction. And this house did experience reduction in the energy use that matched that. But what I really encourage people to do, and energy assessors out there to do, is to consider how much those measures cost so that you can work out the relative bang for buck. So in this column, I'm showing the cost per megajoule um, in terms of reduced energy use. So bang for buck, you'll hear me talk about a lot on my efficient electric home. How am I going to have time? Um, this case study is one that I talk about in the Renew webinar that I mentioned earlier. So you can get a lot more detail about it there. But these clients um, came to us living in a 1940s cottage that had been extended about 20 years ago. Um, they're approaching retirement and they've got this lovely big block and they thought the only way they were going to be comfortable in their retirement was to build an entirely new home out the back. So they actually came to us with that in mind. They wanted us to do a feasibility study to look at that. So I said, sure, we could do that. Um, let's check it out. But please also let me um, have a look at your existing house and let me assess the potential there. Um, we did that and I was able to show them, I did a bigger report than this, but able to show them that their existing house did have considerable potential, um, mainly through basic draft ceiling um, and some uh, insulation upgrades or patch uh, filling gaps in the ceiling and insulating the um, the double brick walls in the cottage so that the thermal mass um, in the little original cottage could really start working for them. They were very sceptical, they admit. Um, we came in, we did the uh, thermal imaging of the insulation, you can see here, the air leakage testing, that's what these thermal images are showing, that there was lots of air leakage, all really, really easy to fix. The clients decided to give it a go um, and this was their response. Um, after last summer. They were basically completely blown away that their house that was previously leaky and incredibly hot and uncomfortable during extreme heat waves and intense bushfire smoke actually performed incredibly well and friends were coming round to their house as the little sanctuary, which was a big um, turnaround. They say in this that they look forward to next winter. Um, I can show you now how they went in winter. So both the July and the October quarters, these guys are still on gas. We're working on, working on getting them off gas, um, but their energy consumption has massively dropped. And that was despite um, members of the household being at home working during the pandemic um, when they're usually in the office. Cool. All right, another one. Uh, this is another little classic brick veneer um, house in uh, a Canberra suburb. Um, lots and lots of little houses like this and there's lots of houses like this all over Australia. Um, I know you can't read the detail in that, but again, I just want to encourage people to seek local assistance from an energy assessor um, to help them make informed decisions about how to retrofit their home. Because there's, um, I can't see my, there we go. There are all sorts of things. So I've, this just shows the effects of draft ceiling, insulating the external walls, topping up the ceiling insulation, um, insulating under the floor. This one's a suspended timber floor, upgrading the glazing, some slight changes to the design. This house went from 2.5 stars to 7.5 stars. Um, and this column shows the relative bang for buck. And as always, draft ceiling is your number one bang for buck. And these guys went, um, got rid of their gas heating. It's great. So they've got the one split system in their living area now and it's doing the job beautifully. Oh, that just shows that in a little more detail. Another case study. This one actually won the Australian Green Smart Award last year. It's a 113 square metre house. Um, again, a 1970s brick veneer house, suspended timber. Little rectangle, um, it was three bedrooms, one bathroom, really poorly laid out, didn't make the most of the orientation, didn't connect to its front and backyards very well. I turned it into a four bedroom, two bathroom, uh, second living area, area plus study home, all within the same footprint. So without extending, I really encourage people to look at how they can use their existing footprint. 
um, you can find more information about this one online and I, I also talked about it in the Renew webinar I did at the start of last year. So I won't go on about it, but I'll just show you a couple of pictures. Um, don't give up on your old houses. They can um, really be brought back to life. This one is another one. I'm not going to show you um, any more detail on this one, but again, it started out at a really low level of performance and was um, without any extension, just with focusing on, focusing on insulation, draft ceiling, in this case, upgrading the windows. Um, it now performs beautifully. Again, the gas heating was removed um, and it's doing incredibly well. So what do I want to stress to people? Everyone wants a better home. It's where you spend most of your time with the people you love. It should feel great. It shouldn't cost a fortune to run. All of those things um, go hand in hand with all electric. Um, so, and, and existing houses have enormous potential. Just get some help and some advice, or of course, ask on my official electric home. Um, last thing I want to stress, bigger doesn't equal better. Um, I've already said this a million times, existing houses can be massively improved. Thermal bang for buck is really important. Every house is different. That's why I suggest you integrate some science. But these four things are key. Draft ceiling, insulating, better window dressings and external shading of your windows. So window dressings for winter, external shading for summer, and switching to reverse cycle air conditioning, those wonderful heat pumps for heating and cooling. And you can read about my house and how I did exactly that. Lots of information on the website. Um, one more plug for the ACT. We recently, um, the Conservation Foundation recently established a new website called Make the Switch. It's got some fantastic resources on it um, about helping you calculate the cost of switching from gas to electric and all about induction cooking and, and various things. So I encourage you to check that out. But that's enough from me. Thank you. Thanks so much, Jenny. I love your enthusiasm and the stories of how you go about finding potential in existing homes, the best, and also great to see the photo of your team too and put faces behind your beautiful designs and renovations. Um, I, I want to reset at this point. I know I've been watching the kind of ticker tick up of um, new participants joining us um, over the past 30 minutes or so. My name is Kalia Colston. I'm your host tonight uh, for the My Efficient Electric Home Switching Off Fossil Fuels event presented as part of the Sustainable Living Festival. Tonight we're finding out how you can improve your home and save money and get off fossil fuels. Uh, I'm sure lots of you have questions already for Jenny and Tim. Um, remember if you'd like to ask a question we'll get to those at the end after the next presentation um, but do start sending them through on the q a i like the people that have already done that because it means that we can just kick the q a off and we're not going to be waiting around for your questions so if you have one put them there on the q a and we'll come to them after our next speaker who is richard keach um, i'll introduce richard richard he's an engineer he's a consultant and author and uh, his book the energy freedom home uh, you should get your hands on. Uh, like Jenny and Tim, his knowledge about how you can improve your home is extraordinary. And tonight his uh, talk is entitled Energy and Comfort at Home. Uh, and he's gonna talk about the key lessons and challenges for home energy and comfort based on his experience delivering over 500 professional home sustainability assessments. Thanks, Richard, the floor is yours. Thank you, Kalia, Tim, <coughs> Jenny, and Katie behind the scenes. Welcome, everybody. It's great to be here on Bannerong Country talking to you tonight. Um, energy and comfort at home, understanding the problem. So hopefully, you can all see that. There we go. So, first, some context and caveats. Um, I've been doing home efficiency assessments since mid 2015 here in Victoria, Australia. Um, these days, uh, my freelance business is new energy thinking and uh, four days a week I'm working for NH Consulting doing commercial energy efficiency and renewable consulting. Uh, this is not intended to be a comprehensive analysis of home energy and it's my personal opinion only. Um, okay. Um, it's empowering to understand the energy fundamentals and common problems with existing homes. Uh, it helps us appreciate what's reasonable to accept or 
as the case may be, not accept. Um, we can ha that helps us learn from others and see your own house from a different perspective. I've seen so many houses or so many homeowners have light bulb moments when doing a home assessment. So um, this may help you too. Uh, I'd like to acknowledge Morris and Lynn Benet from EcoMaster where I learned, I kept my teeth doing home assessments with them. Um, three pillars of home energy and comfort as I see it. Passive thermal performance as Jenny emphasized and Tim, uh, using renewable energy and electrification. So I'd like to think of those as the three pillars. Um, passive thermal performance is mostly about thermal envelope and in the case of new builds, um, passive solar design as well. Uh, renewable energy, of course, everyone knows about rooftop solar, but heat pump technology, as Tim mentioned, uh, is in a very real sense, a renewable energy technology and electrification is stopping using gas. So I'm gonna focus on the, the passive thermal performance side of things tonight. And um, uh, as per Tim's talk, that's the electrification and uh, stop using gas piece. So thermal envelope, what, what, what is it? It's, I think of it as the set of, set of surfaces that separate the inside from the outside, the walls, floor, ceiling, windows, doors, also known as the building envelope. Ignorance is bliss. Well, very few people, very few people pay for good advice um, in my experience, but luckily there's enough to have helped pay the bills over the last few years. Um, and that's because most people are oblivious to how bad their homes really are. Um, so there's a real need to adjust expectations, that is adjust them upwards. Um, for those people who have commissioned home assessments, it's interesting to look at what's motivated those. The main motivating reason is comfort. So, which to an extent that surprised me. So I, I estimate that of the 500 plus assessments, 95% or more were motivated because people weren't comfortable enough. Uh, and mostly that's winter comfort. Um, some people wanted dollar savings and fewer still wanted uh, were motivated principally by environmental issues. So yeah, comfort is really what gets people into this, but it shouldn't be the only thing. So thermal comfort really focuses people's minds. So the, the first insight uh, arising from my, my work doing home assessments, it, it, it's my attempt at a big picture analogy that homes are like leaky buckets. The heat flowing through homes is like water flowing out of a leaky bucket. So in this analogy, you've got the bucket itself, it has water in it and that water has depth. Well, um, the, the bucket is like the thermal envelope of our house. The water is like the heat energy and the depth of the water is like the temperature in the house. So this, this um, analogy has got good explanatory power because it helps think in terms of heat energy and less about temperature. Uh, it helps explain how uh, the heat flow is variable and controllable and, and that a law of diminishing return applies. Um, a good performance is impossible without fixing all or most of the problems, just like without fixing all or most of the holes in the bucket, it's still a leaky bucket. So, and it helps inform uh, or, or make sense of the idea that you, know, you should fix the biggest hole first. So what's the biggest hole in your personal bucket? So in other words, what's the dominant pathway for uncontrolled heat flow through your home's thermal envelope? And then what's the next one and so on. Uh, don't sweat the little things. It, it's, it's dealing with the biggest pathways for uncontrolled heat flow that make the biggest difference. Uh, so th this type of thinking helps guide decisions about priorities, helps develop a plan. You can do all this by getting a home assessment. Okay, so in getting a home assessment, the emphasis really is on fixing the thermal envelope first. And that's because improvements to the thermal envelope directly reduce energy spend. They make you more passively comfortable as Jenny emphasized. In other words, there are fewer hours when active heating and cooling is required. An improved thermal envelope makes our houses more resilient. That is 
climate safe. They're, they're safer places to be in extreme weather. Uh, it helps reduce condensation, you know, equals less mold, equals improved air quality. Uh, and our heating systems work better. For example, there's less stratification, uh, reduced noise. In other words, pathways for uncontrolled heat flow are often pathways for noise as well. Uh, a house with an improved thermal envelope can have smaller uh, heating and cooling systems. So there's indirect cost savings there too. So the, the rest of this talk is going to be looking at d discrete um, specific issues. Um, so first one, insulation and insulating. So the problem is small gap equals big problem. So here's an example in a client ceiling. You see looking downwards uh, to the ceiling at my feet, um, gaps in insulation. You can see through the back of the ceiling plaster there. This is a similar house looking up at the ceiling on a cold day with the thermal Im imaging camera. That photo was taken with this camera. This is a phone with a built-in thermal imaging camera. Um, very handy for thermal assessments. Um, and those, that spottiness, uh, in this case, the, the darker spots equals um, places where insulation is not complete. Uh, so it's not trivial. There's lots of spots and this is really common. This is not the exception. Um, so existing in-roof insulation is insufficient and in poor condition. So the impact, it compromises the thermal performance by more than you would think. So in my, I've formed the view over these five years that a typical home has about a quarter of the minimum recommended level of ceiling insulation and that's not good. So Jenny mentioned that 5% ceiling uncovered equals halving of performance. Where that estimate comes from is this chart. This is from out of the National Construction Code. Uh, it's a table used to inform what are called derating calculations, but without going into details about it, if you have R5 bats and you have 5% uncovered, then the net effective insulation is R2.5. So that's 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 a bad thing. There there are more takeaways from that from that chart, but we uh, we don't really have the time to go through it. So the, the best takeaway message is that the thermal performance is dominated by the worst part of the insulated structure. And once you th think of it through that lens, it's easy to understand why small gaps make a big difference. So the main culprits in regard to insulation impacts, downlights and the gaps left around them, incomplete initial installation. You know, here's a big swathe of uninsulated ceiling plaster. Um, here's a renovation with uh, poor insulation. Here's a thermal imaging, a thermal image showing the gap around uh, a, a, um, uh, an air, uh, air conditioning duct. Here's it from the other side. As you can see, um, what's, what's happened there, there was a, a bat there, it's been removed, set aside and, and the duct put in place without that being trimmed back properly. Uh, voids like this are common, especially in newer homes. Uh, that's a bad thing, they're often uninsulated. Bulkhead walls, often second story uh, extensions have sections of wall that adjoin into roof space. That's often what they look like from in the roof. Uh, random damage by trades, this sort of thing isn't uncommon. Um, steel frames equal thermal bridges. Um, bats still left in their bag. Uh, Jenny mentioned that. It's something I've seen a fair bit of too. Uh, that's, that's the same case there. Uh, very sad to see that sort of thing. Um, old glass fibre bats that are sagged over time and vermin damage, that's what we're seeing in that picture. So um, the typical retrofit solution is start with fixing the down lights, then make good the existing insulation layer. You usually don't need to throw away the bats that are there. Um, add another layer over the top. Here's uh, Leah from Thermahome fixing up um, a, bulk, a poorly insulated bulkhead wall. Uh, add another uh, layer over the top. Here's the end result of a retrofit insulation Again, done by Thermahome, formerly Ecomaster. Uh, target uh, R5 to R6 for good results. Next issue, downlights suck. Um, downlights compromise efficiency in so many ways um, that it's not funny. Um, the impact is 
a compromised insulation. So here's a thermal image on a hot day showing a hot spot around a downlight. This is it, or well, that sort of thing from the other side. You can see uh, large gaps left. Um, in this case, an older downlight does need a gap left around it for safety, but very often the gap left is much bigger than it need to, needs to be. Um, often uh, downlights permit drafts by design. Um, so here's an example of a downlight fitting with a ring. Uh, it's a ventilated fitting and then that's been uh, augmented with a, a, an LED bulb, but that bulb is not self ventilated. So in replacing um, a, a legacy halogen light, this LED has actually made the draft proofing worse. Uh, here's a legacy halogen light, um, which obviously uh, poor lighting efficiency. And there's a fourth problem is often there's uh, an inefficient transformer. And this is a thermal image where that blob, uh, orange blob on the right is actually the transformer sitting on the plaster, generating enough heat that it's visible from within inside the house with a thermal imaging camera. So the solution is don't replace the, the light bulb with uh, uh, a, an LED, replace the entire fitting. So this is what a good modern uh, integrated sealed LED light fitting looks like. Um, it's got, you're looking for this symbol on it to indicate that it's safe and legal to cover with insulation. I see in that context stands for insulation contact. If you see that it's safe to, and legal to cover, uh, the prices of these are reasonable. If in doubt, don't cover it with insulation. Passive solar design um, is a big problem, or the lack of passive solar design. Um, homes that make poor use of the available opportunities to control sunlight. Impact is excessive heat loss. So the culprits, uh, the basic design mistakes, uh, orientation. So here's an example. The wall on the right hand side of the picture is a north facing wall, nice eaves. That would have been a great wall to have window, uh, a, a north facing window that adjoined a living space, but alas, there was no window there. Uh, lack of eaves, all too common in modern builds. Um, and it's a bigger problem than you think. It's not just the, la the, sh the foregone shading, but it has significant impact on the ability to properly insulate roofs. Um, so al fresco areas um, are a blight on modern design in my opinion. So here's an example of a covered outside area, which f causes the adjoining uh, living spaces to be deeply shaded. Um, so bad, uh, lost opportunity for uh, winter sun and for, for daylight all year round. So the solution, well, it's hard to retrofit fundamental design faults, but you might be able to add a clerestory window here and there if you're lucky. Um, if, if you're uh, able, avoid alfresco areas and skylights. Uh, and, and if you have the opportunity to design from scratch with a renovation, or a new build designed with the sun in mind properly. Use the winter sun to your advantage, block the summer sun. So here's an example of a, of a awning I helped design for a client with an upward sloping. So the house is on the right hand side. Uh, the conventional design would have, the, have that uh, pergola um, sloping downwards or horizontal, but by facing it upwards, it gives the opportunity for the sun to come in underneath the pergola. And I think that's the sort of thing you want to be looking for. Um, here's a new home. This happens to be my home where I moved in last week uh, here at Cape Patterson. And it's just a great example. Uh, I've tried to make the best uh, passive solid de design that I can with lots of north facing shading, uh, deep eaves, um, uh, and so on. More about that one uh, on my blog in future. Um, so next issue, window coverings not done right. Um, all too often I go into people's homes and see big windows with no window coverings or window coverings that don't work very well. So here's uh, wall to ceiling glass, um, looks lovely, um, thermally terrible. Uh, here's another one. Uh, this, this house was only uh, less than two years old when I assessed it um, and they wondered why. Uh, their home wasn't performing well. Uh, to a large part, windows with, n with no window coverings. Um, so excess uncontrolled heat flow through windows is what happens when you don't have good window coverings. 
So the solution is good window coverings, which are able to hold a still, a, mostly still air against the glass. That's what you're looking for. Uh, hopefully closed at the top with um, uh, a carrier or, or pelmet that, that uh, prevents uh, most of the airflow. Um, cellular blinds are a great um, exemplar of what works well. So here's a nice picture from Luxaflex of, of uh, cellular blinds looking good. This is side on of the cellular blinds at my house in Essendon. Okay, moving on, um, leaky houses suck. Um, so as Jenny mentioned, um, poor attention to uncontrolled air pathways is a big problem. It causes a loss of beneficial heat and cool, ingress of dust, insects and noise. The culprits, poorly sealed external doors, fireplaces, cavity sliding doors, uh, dishwashers, exhaust fans uh, can let in uh, and out lots of uh, heat. Uh, architrave gaps, lots, that's a very common thing to see, pipe penetrations. Um, so the solution, avoid cavity sliding doors, don't use conventional weather strips. I recommend Ecomaster draft dodges as a superior solution. Cork up architrave gaps and pipe penetrations, upgrade exhaust fans. Here's what a, a, a draft stopper ex, uh, exhaust fan cover looks like in place. Uh, plug up unused fireplaces. So fireplaces, fires are draft amplifiers. Um, flu gases discharged are balanced with cold air drawn from outside. So fires induce drafts. So uh, that is the, they offset the warmth provided. Um, so in other words, the, if you're getting four units of warmth from the, from the fire, you might be getting two units of warmth lost to outside uh, because of the drafts induced. Uh, and there are lots of other issues with fires as well. Um, solar hot water uh, is my next topic. Uh, lots of Victorian homes have solar hot water systems that are gas boosted like this one. Here's that unit with a thermal imaging camera. What's wrong with this picture? What's wrong is you can't see any hot spots on that. Like, or what's up there, that's just the sun reflected. But you expect to see hot spots around the fittings there. In other words, this operating uh, hot water system, the tank was completely cold. Uh, and the, uh, it, it, its presence, it gives people a false sense of security about using renewable energy, because in this case, the solar part of this gas boosted hot water system is not working at all. And in my experience, this is surprisingly common. There are hundreds of thousands of homes in Victoria with solar hot water that doesn't actually work a damn. Uh, it also means wasted roof space, a lost opportunity for solar PV. So it's the, the culprits are these budget flat panel solar hot water units uh, that fail in a way that's not often seen because the shortfall is made up entirely by the gas booster. Um, and, and I think it's, a, it's an unintended consequence of seemingly good Victorian regulations encouraging solar hot water. Um, pity. So um, the solution is don't use solar hot water uh, in Victoria. Um, recommend heat pump water services like the one Tim showed before. Um, keep your roof for PV. So glazing, um, people underestimate the problems with single glazing and people think double glazing is a silver bullet uh, and there's a lack of awareness of secondary glazing. So the impact is uh, lack of attention to glazing improvements. So um, my observation is going from single to double glaze windows takes windows from being terrible to just being nearly bad. Um, when I say this to clients, it often generates some amusement, um, but it's an important way to think that um, double glazing is necessary but not sufficient um, to, to uh, give us good thermal performance. So uh, and the other problem is uh, in new builds, double glazing is often used to increase the performance of, uh, increase the size of the windows without actually improving the thermal performance. So double glazing is necessary, but not sufficient is the takeaway message there. So glazing is a weak link. The solution is don't over glaze in new builds, double glaze if you can, and fit secondary glazing um, if you're retrofitting. So double glazing plus good window coverings is the solution. Secondary glazing 
we don't have time to go into it in detail, but it's adding another layer, uh, another glazing layer to an existing window. This is a product called Eco Glaze. There are other products out there. So windows are there to be opened, uh, controlled ventilation. Uh, if you're uh, improving the ventilation of your, uh, the draft proofing of your house, um, the, it, there's an increased onus on you to, um, to ventilate actively. Um, airtight homes aren't necessarily stuffy um, because you know, you've still got those windows to open. Increased onus on occupant to ventilate. Um, next issue, ducting sucks. Um, heat loss through ducting is, is bad. Tim posted a picture much like this one uh, on, the, on the Facebook group uh, yesterday, I think it was. Um, so a surprising number of people have ducted systems that have ruptured or leaky ducts uh, and that causes problems when the systems are operating but it also causes problems uh, all the other hours of the year as well because of uh, the pathways from air inside the house into the ceiling space that that allows. Uh, ducts involve whole of house circulation uh, and when you've got the heating ducts at ceiling level, you end up with stratification. This is a picture showing a house in winter with the heating's been on a couple of hours and you can see above about chest level, it's warm and below chest level, it's still cold, that's stratification. Um, there's still a lot of fan energy involved in ducting. Uh, the return air vent locations can be problematic. So the solution is to use reverse cycle split systems for heating and cooling. So um, that's uh, winding it up. So if you're interested in, uh, aside, aside from joining uh, My Efficient Electric Home, um, you might be interested in looking at my blog, newenergythinking.com. Um, you might be interested in my book, The Energy Freedom Home. And, and that's it, thank you. Uh, sorry, that's been a bit rushed, but uh, hopefully there's a chance for Q&A uh, following, thanks. Thanks, Richard, and there is going to be time for Q&A. Uh, and the questions have been coming in thick and fast, so we're going to get through and as many as we can. And I just want to observe that no wonder this group has 25,000 plus members and growing because just the wealth of, of the admins is worth joining for, let alone all the sharing that goes on between all the members of My Efficient Electric Home. Um, these three legends are going to answer your questions. I'm going to do my best to compile them and ask them so that Jenny, Richard and Tim can focus on answering. You can still share them in the Q&A section and we'll get through as many as we can. I think I can do some rapid fire at the beginning. Um, uh, and also, you know, it's the first time you three, I understand, have been part of an event all together. So you might have questions for each other. So let's just be a little bit free form um, with it. But I wanted to, um, assuming we're all in panel view now and everyone can see us all together. So I'm going to pretend like I'm looking at you all. Hello. Um, uh, Gillian wants to know, um, are window coverings essential if windows are double glazed? Um, okay, Jenny. Okay, yes, yeah, sorry, Richard. Um, yeah, look, certainly in cooler climates where we use a lot of energy for heating, um, yes, you do need window dressings. It's one I often talk to clients about. Um, the modelling shows, and I, I love showing clients this, that even in our super um, optimised houses that take advantage of the um, you know, solar passive gain and have lots of great insulation and double glazing, still can reduce their energy consumption over winter by between 15 and 20 percent just by installing a good window dressing so yes it is worth it and you will feel the comfort difference if you um you lose less heat to those cold windows so yes great and um i think some of the questions have been answered in the chat and the q a but we are recording this and you will be able to access it later for on YouTube. So I want to ask some of the questions that were answered for other people. Pretty please, can we have the list of all the websites and everything that you've been sort of dropping into the conversation tonight? Where can people go for that? Yeah, and I, and I mentioned there that um, if people are on Facebook or they know somebody that's on Facebook or they can find somebody who's on Facebook, we have, uh, we have some announcements at the Facebook group and that's where we put some of the good stuff so try and find those announcements um, and see what's there. But one of those announcements has to do with information sources. 
So it will point you to Richard's book and it will point you to a number of articles that Jenny's written and articles that I've written. It'll point you to yourhome.gov.au, a lot of the good things from, from the organization known as Renew, et cetera. So there's a, a long list there. We can make the list longer, but it's pretty long already. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, excellent. A uh, uh, question from Kate. Is ducted reverse cycle just as efficient as a wall mounting split? After you, Richard. Okay, short answer no. Um, there's too much energy lost in the ducts, um, and there's a whole bunch of other problems with ducting. Uh, I, I sort of touched on them in my, at the end of my talk there, um, but uh, short answer no easy. All right. Uh, Jenny, how do you prevent uh, moisture and mould issues when doing all this draft sealing? Uh, and that's one question there, double bar barreled it. Do you yeah. add ventilation? Yeah, look, that's a really important point. Air tightness and ventilation are separate things, but they have to be considered together. So a, a building science mantra is that you must build tight, but ventilate right. So yes, ventilation is really important, but it's a different thing. So air leakage is that random, uncontrolled um, air movement and energy loss through your building envelope that's happening all the time. Ventilation is planned for, designed in, and controlled by you. So um, I put a link in the Q&A to an article I've written on condensation management that explains that a bit more. But ventilation and air leakage go hand in hand. I'm not talking about the le level of air tightness that's equivalent to the passive house standard where you ha have to have mechanical ventilation. Um, we don't uh, design and build that way. Um, but I also have written an article about that. Um, so I'll, I'll leave it at that. All right, and I, I, um, I mean, while you're there, I, I just love this question from Alistair. So I, I he, um, Alistair wants to get started and become an energy assessor. I just imagine this surely as we try and eliminate emissions and we try and have comfort, more comfort in our homes and lower bills and all the things you've been talking about tonight, we're going to need more people in that part of the industry. Um, so Alice is interested in how he can go about that, but he also wants to know how each of you started your journey. And I thought maybe we can just stick with you first, Jenny. And I know that you're, um, yeah, tell us where you started um, on your kind of scientific building science journey. Yeah, well, there are a few key things. I, I grew up in Tasmania and my parents, uh, who were just middle class school teacher and guy who worked at the airport on the ground, um, did two architect designed homes uh, in Tasmania that were quite solar passive um, in their nature. And that was because my dad went to school with an architect. So I got this early exposure that I didn't realise had a big impact on me until much later. Um, I actually mainly did biological sciences, a lot of physics and chemistry as well. But then then went into science communication. One of my former students um, did the Carbon Cops TV show that some of you might remember from um, 2008 or seven. Um, and she used a blower door in that, my good friend Lish Fair. And I thought, my God, I've moved into this cold house in Canberra. That's what I need. I need a blower door test. The next day I got on the blower to try and find a blower door and realised the only one being used in the Australian residential sector was the one that had been used on the TV show. So that led me to think there's huge potential here. And then the thermal modelling, a huge potential, the uh, thermal imaging. So I just took a plunge in 2008 and resigned from uh, a job and thought I'm going to uh, pursue it. So I trained up in the National Software. I went to New Zealand. I went to the US to train in blower door testing and threw myself in, in the deep end and then did a lot of basic uh, testing and retrofitting. So I've climbed in roof spaces. I have <laughs> been down on my knees and I have caulked and I have I've, uh, done the hard yards. Um, but yeah, an interesting evolution. But over to the boys. I'm interested to hear this. Story. Yeah, me too. Richard, you're, uh, you're unmuted. You're, um, you're okay. Um, I guess there's two ways of looking at answering Alice's question. But it, 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 if the question is making a career change, holus bolus, then that's what I did. Um, I, I had my climate change epiphany about 2007, thanks to Al Gore's Inconvenient Truth. And in 2010, I, I well, the start of 2010, I quit my uh, job in commercial IT and went back to uni and did a master's of environment at Melbourne University. So the master's program there is excellent. Uh, 
and that let me major in energy efficiency modeling and implementation. So it was a good, um, good complement to my engineering background. So I felt, felt that was the best way of leveraging what I already knew and, and directing it into the uh, energy efficiency space. And so off the back of that um, second master's degree, I, I managed to eke out a little bit of paid work in, in the not-for-profit space, doing work for Beyond Zero Emissions, and then started to get some gigs doing this, that, and the other. Uh, and it took a long time to get um, back into full, full paid, full-time em employment. But, uh, so uh, to, to ask this question, if, if you're looking at making a career of this, this can be quite difficult, but uh, very, very rewarding. And, and um, me last possibly. So I trained as a chemical engineer and worked like in the oil and gas industry. So the joke is that I'm spending my semi-retirement paying back all my climate, uh, climate guilt. <laughs> but, um, but part of it is actually that, you know, I always worked in energy efficiency. And these days, even though I used to work in the gas industry, I run around telling people gas is too expensive to burn because we have these other better alternatives. So there's just the, the logic there for me that is just so important. But um, more to the, the different types of modeling. When you say you want to be an energy assessor, there's different sorts. And uh, like there's some links you can see there like to this thing called NATHERS. And that's a, that's a modeling tool that uh, can model the building shell. And so there are people that are NATHERS assessors. And like if you're building a new house and it needs to meet six star, seven star, whatever, that's the sort of modeling you have done there. But I've never done it. I'm not trained in that. Um, but there is a different sort of assessor um, in Victoria anyway, and this is being spread to the other jurisdictions as well. Um, in Victoria, they call it the Victorian Residential Efficiency Scorecard. So that's another way, another qualification you can get, another way that you can assess a house. It has a lot of the same software behind it of the NATHERS, but it has a few other things. And you actually go to the home and uh, you look at what sort of heating system it has, what star rating you put in a bit more data for that to Victorian residential efficiency scorecard that's being rolled out to the other jurisdictions. But, um, uh, you know, Richard says he's been in over 500 homes, me the same. Look, I'm, I learn something new every time I go into a, another home. Every home is different. I like to say that, you know, I used to model things like chemical plants and refineries, but homes are more difficult because Ooh chemical plants and refineries, we try to minimize the variables where it looks like the architects, they try to maximize the variables. Uh -oh. <laughs> Only uh, less than 4% of homes in Australia even involve an architect. <laughs> so you can't blame the architects. I'll come to their defense on that one. <laughs> um, well, we, well um, that's so true. <laughs> um, how do we find an assessor? Maybe Tim, you've got a quick answer for this. If people want somebody to come, well, yeah, and again, it depends what you want. Are you building a new house and you need to, uh, you know, get it assessed with that NATHERS, whatever tool applies in your state, um, then that could be one sort of assessor. But if you're just looking for people that could give you, you know, could crawl up in your roof space and look at your ducks and give you a lot of general information, um, uh, you know, yeah, if you can get on Facebook, go on Facebook. We've got a few different links in previous posts ab about uh, where we do have people already in the group that could help you out. How do you track them down? The, the Facebook group is a searchable database and I probably wouldn't be involved with it if it weren't a searchable database. I'm not just interested in an ongoing random chat, but you can go into the Facebook group. You can type in like Brisbane assessor and, and see what comes out. You may find a previous post, but the, the other folks may want to comment on that as well. <laughs> I've, I've popped a link up to um, some various um, NATHERS assessor accrediting organisations where people can hop on and search that, and they tend to be sort of Queensland, Victoria um, and New South Wales based, but they, um, are, a lot of assessors elsewhere are also registered with them. But, um, they're the NATHERS assessors, but yeah, the um, Residential Energy Efficiency Scores card is another interesting um, system. Right, I'm quickly reading the next question while you're answering as well. Glenda asks, uh, how does a heat pump hot water service compare with a solar panel hot water service? Um, and she says that she can turn off power from October till April to the hot water and have enough hot water without using any power. I think I'll let Richard go into detail with that one. But, but yeah, with those solar thermal systems, a lot of people focus on the good days and ignore the bad ones. So yeah, I can do in this, do this and that all summer long, but uh, you know, what are you doing in the winter? So I might pass over to Richard on that one. Yeah, 
thanks, Tim. In the work, in the research we did for the uh, BZD buildings plan um, back in 2013, uh, that's it there. Um, we looked at this question in detail and what we found was that in Southern Australia, um, solar thermal hot water systems use too much energy in winter. Um, if, and that's, so that sort of offsets the, the, the benefits often. Um, and the, the other point that people often don't take into account is that um, people, a lot of people with solar hot water systems end up manually boosting. That is, they, they turn on the boosting function of the hot water service um, manually based on their subjective need, not based upon a thermostat setting. So they're not comparing apples with apples to a, to a hot water service that's always boosted to the same temperature year round. And, and of, if you're curious to follow that, follow down that rabbit hole, um, there's a post uh, on my efficient electric home uh, that I did a few years ago now called hot water more than meets the eye, I think is what it was called. And, and I've blogged about it since. So yeah, have a look at that. And, and I can add in that from personal experience here in Canberra, where although it gets very cold, we get loads of winter sunshine. So I was a huge fan of solar hot water and my previous house had, had evacuated tubes. And until 2017, all of our previous project, uh, projects, so that's 50, 60 projects had used evacuated tubes. We made the switch for my house. And again, I'm a self-admitted data nerd. I can assure you, we are not going back to evacuated tubes. Um, the heat pump technology is fantastic. Another thing to consider is you don't have to have something sitting on your roof, taking out roof space that could be used for um, solar panels. And you don't have something that can get smashed in a hailstorm, which we've certainly experienced here in Canberra too. So yeah, heat pumps are great. Yeah, one last insight about that. Um, with solar thermal hot water systems, um, if, you're, if they're big enough to generate enough water for a lot of the year, then invariably they generate excess heat in, in summertime. So the problem with that is you've got this capacity for, for collecting energy that you can't do anything with. Whereas an equivalent solar PV, um, that, that surplus energy can go into other things in the house, or if that's in surplus, then it can go out to the grid. So you can't use your surplus with the solar hot water. All right, um, there's just so much knowledge here. I'm going to keep going with questions because there's some great ones coming in. Uh, Raghava asks, is a lighter roof colour always beneficial or choosing the colour should depend on the direction of the roof and energy modelling results? Okay, Jenny. Um, okay. So <laughs> I've got a super sustainable award-winning house and I'm not shy to admit that it's got a dark, relatively dark coloured roof. Um, I'm one, I often get into debates about this. Yes, roof colour, we often do light coloured roofs too, and I would never discourage anyone from doing a light coloured roof. But the impact of a dark coloured roof, if you're designing a smaller, smarter, sustainable home, mine's surrounded by garden, uh, and, um, and you're insulating your ceiling very well, which is what we do without gaps and your draft ceiling, then the impact of a dark coloured roof on the thermal performance of your home is negligible you know it's, it's really tiny and i've got data from from my roof space people can see it um it can search in um, my efficient electric home um so i think it gets overblown but of course i think the bigger problem is huge houses taking up entire blocks not having green space not having any garden so it's, they're just big chunks of thermal mass so again i don't want to discourage people around, away from larger roofs but i, I don't think it's um it's the big issue um that people should be focused on. If I can just add one thing there, a side effect of a dark roof that people often don't account for is they make um, solar panels, solar PV work worse because as solar panels get hot, they generate less electricity. And the downside of a light roof is that you get more condensation in your roof space. Um, it's 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 not a one answer, um, you know. 
But the, yeah. the, color, the color of the roof shouldn't matter that much anyway, because you're going to cover it up with solar panels anyhow. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> um, Andrew asks, foiled versus opaque cellular blinds, uh, what should be considered when making this choice? You get to know a lot about what people are really grappling with in life, don't you? Yeah. <laughs> Fascinating. I love this. What I love about the My Efficient Home group is that you learn so much about what other people are going through. And sometimes people are just making exactly the same choice that you're trying to make. Um, but yeah, uh, versus opaque cellular. Um, I've got opaque cellular. Um, I like the look of them better. Um, the foil, um, I, I think, Look, it, it could be great, but if you're concerned, if you're putting in foil because you think you're uh, reducing the heat gain from um, outside, which is what a lot of people think, it's actually helping them inside too, but you really need to shade a window externally to reduce the heat gain through a window. So internal window dressings for winter warmth, um, external shading to reduce summer heat gain. Shading a window externally, stopping that sun from striking the glass will reduce the heat gain through that window by about 80%. So it's huge, mm. um, really, really significant. Do you guys want to add anything to that? No. No, all good. Um, all right, Cameron um, has a question. So he's, his place has a lot of windows. Um, they're very thin glass. Um, he says in brackets, essentially holes in the walls that are a particular type of fashion that are sort of a grid pattern. How can these types of windows be upgraded to double glazing while still keeping the same style unique for this particular house? So again, that's, yeah. I guess people wonder about. Mm. Yeah, the grid patterns often called colonial rails um, and, and it is a period look. Um, some houses with colonial rails can, uh, are amenable to having secondary glazing fitted so one large pane with the, the gridded infill uh, can have a single sheet of perspex added uh, as a, a secondary glazing element. Um, alternatively, I've seen double, new double glazed units with um, a gridded pattern added on the outside. Uh, doesn't look as good. You know, one of the benefits with secondary glazing if on windows where it works uh, is that it um, preserves the, the uh, often the period character of the windows. The windows carry a lot of the character of older, older houses and you don't want to throw that away. So often secondary glazing is better than, than new double glazing because you're, invest, you're, you're preserving that investment um, in the house. Completely agree. And we, we do that with a lot of older homes too. We don't replace windows um, all the time. Um, you know, but uh, yeah, secondary glazing can be really effective. An extra perspex layer inside on the inside. Yeah. Great. Um, we said we're going to aim for about 8.30 um, local time here in Melbourne. Um, but there are a couple more questions. So we're happy to hang around and ask, answer a few more. Um, okay. All right, so Ness gets the prize for asking the most questions um, and she turns out is based in New Zealand um, and she says in New Zealand um, so many new builds are very poorly designed and built, built to code minimum, major heat loss, poor quality, aluminium joinery, very leaky, big problems, lots of things going on there. How do you encourage people to spend more on, um, on or to prioritise a more efficient home? Um, and she, I guess she's observing here that people don't seem to want to compromise on style or layout, things like that. And there's another question I'll follow up with about how to convince a partner that these things are important. So I think there's sort of some choices there that people are trying to make and trying to convince others that they can make better choices. So I guess, I don't know, Tim, we haven't heard from you for a while. How do you, change, how do you convince people? Yeah, I, there was a, just had a client today, they, they came to my house to look at things we had there, but we were looking at the plans for their new build and the house was really, really big. I don't know if the folks might be listening here tonight. And um, so I, I just challenged them a bit as to whether or not they really needed all that space now or in the next 10 years. I mean, you can add some rooms on later on. I, as I said, look, that bedroom's on the plan now. If you take it off the plan, you can still add it back on later, just like it was on the plan, I guess. Um, the architects and, and others could tell me that. But um, I guess what I challenged them with was, 
you're spending a lot of money for all this extra space. You could reduce that space and then you'd have money to spend on all the other stuff that it seemed like they wanted to do, like, um, you know, improving the star rating, having some better windows, et cetera. So um, you could, you know, if it's a new build, you could look at that trade off of, um, you know, just how much room do you need? And if you don't need as much as you thought you did, well, then you've got money you'd think left over to, uh, to do some upgrades around the place. And um, oh, there was one, one little interesting story I didn't realize how, how little insulation a builder might be putting in the walls these days. They, they said the base, the base was 1.8, uh, uh, R 1.8 in the walls. And, um, but they had heard from the builder that upgrading to like R 2.4 was going to cost like 800 bucks. So I'm like, yeah, you do that. Um, so I didn't realize that some builders had uh, gone to reducing the, the wall insulation by that much, but then they weren't actually going to charge them that much to go back to something that would be, better performing. And the way, to, the way to deal with the partner is when you're meeting with the, the energy consultant, have your partner there with you. So uh, you don't have to try to you know, convince your partner on your own. I agree. Yeah. Okay. Um, sorry, Richard, you go. Thanks. Um, so the question of persuasion is an interesting one. Often people are looking through the lens in the first instance of, of cost savings. Uh, you really need to reframe uh, and as I emphasize, uh, the biggest bang is bang for buck it relates to, not to dollars, but to comfort. And, and to have your light bulb moment about that, you really have to visit a high performance home. So people's sort of baseline view is informed by never really having direct personal experience with a high performance house. And I can relate from my own experience, um, we visited a house belonging to a, um, an, a friend who was a builder and built a house down in Portland. Um, I think it was eight and a half stars. And me and the family had stayed the night before in a, in a cold Airbnb uh, and it was an old bluestone cottage and it was freezing. And we visited um, Peter on the Saturday morning um, and it was a cold Saturday morning. Um, and we'd just come from this cold bluestone cottage and we got to his place and he's there in a t-shirt and the heater hadn't been on. So until you have these personal direct experience light bulb moments, it's, it's really hard to, to really, um, to, to really get it. So I'd encourage people who are interested in, and, and open-minded to, to seek out opportunities to stay in uh, high performance houses, just, you know, if it's a visit, if all you can do is visit them for half an hour, then that may, may be enough. If not, um, you might find an Airbnb. I happen to know that there's a, a very high performance house um, up uh, near Lake Eildon, uh, run by John, a guy named John Barrell, that's open as an Airbnb. Um, there may be others. So seek out opportunities like that and just get a direct personal experience. It, it, it will change your perspective. Absolutely. And I think that's a beautiful way to segue into Sustainable House Day. People need to know about Sustainable House Day. Um, it's a, I come from a science and a science communication background. So that hands-on or personal experience is so incredibly valuable. I've had 1,200 people through my own, my own home as well as doing the webinars. But we have houses involved in Sustainable House Day every year and Solar House Day, which is run by the Institute of Architects and the Design Canberra Festival. And I bring prospective clients through these houses because they, they have never experienced them. They live in crappy houses. We've all been there, done that. I lived in 12 rentals in Canberra before I lived in a good house. Um, and, and they go to display villages and they're full of the classic, appalling, six stars if you're lucky houses. And they just don't know what is possible. So completely agree with Richard on that one. Following up from what Tim said, where the, the clients are saying it was $800 to upgrade to uh, 2.4, to those clients, $800 seems like quite a big chunk of money and, and they don't know what they're going to get for that. So again, I would encourage people, um, Natter's modelling or looking at case studies, I am... Um, I've got some blogs that talk more about windows. I'll have to do one that shows the, the impact of upgrading your insulation. So you can see the bang for buck you will get from that $800. Um, yes, yes the, um, the clients today with a, with a new build, and of course they came in and said, look, they tell us it's going to be six star. And uh, of course, a lot of people think, well, the six star sounds good because you know they've heard about six star hotels and those are really good. 
Yeah. But, uh, of course, you need to explain to folks these days in, in Victoria anyway, six star is rock bottom, you know, legal minimum. I, I told them they're not allowed to sell you a house that's worse than this. Yeah. And that's, I, I forget being here in the ACT. In the ACT, people are much more familiar with star ratings than they are, say, in Victoria. Something I also like to take the opportunity to stress is that the star ratings are climate specific. So in a climate like Victoria's or in AC, ACT is really extreme. We go from minus eight to 44 degrees. So a 10 star house is one that doesn't need any heating or cooling. So clearly in Canberra, you're definitely gonna need some heating, even in these really good houses, just a very small amount. If you take some of our designs up to Sydney or friendlier climates, they're at 10 stars. Yet in New South Wales, most houses are done at about the five and a half star max. Um, uh, equivalent to five and a half stars in Ashurst because they use a system called BASICS. So to the people in the friendlier climates, uh, don't think this is just all, um, maybe you won't see, you'll still see massive improvements in comfort. I was gonna say maybe you won't see as big an improvement in comfort, but you can make your houses perform so much better than you realize. Um, so get on it, get a corking gun. You know, you mentioned uh, in your presentation, Jenny, that. Um, around some of the, you know, the opportunities, I guess, in the pandemic, people spend a lot of time at home. Yeah. Um, and there's so many downsides to so much, but there's, you know, upsides too that people are kind of getting more familiar with their homes and things like that. And we know that people, you know, the stats tell us are investing in renovation um, and having a think about it. Um, and then Richard also said, you know, take the time to explore your local neighbourhood. Well, we don't get to travel many other places. So um, there's a lot of opportunity here, but are you sort of seeing people, um, grasping that opportunity to look at the comfort of their home because they're just spending so much more time there? Ab absolutely. We saw two waves last year here in Canberra because, of course, we had, well, everyone knows about the bushfires. Um, in Canberra, the smoke was just incredible. So we had incredible heat waves and that incredible smoke. So suddenly people were um, very aware that their houses were leaky, this time from the outside in. You know, it's, it was it's sometimes harder to pitch about the energy leaking out, but suddenly they realised their houses were really terrible. Um, so people were incredibly uncomfortable and very concerned about their health. Then along comes a pandemic. Um, yeah, and everyone was stuck at home. And here in Canberra, um, it can get bloody cold in winter. So a lot of people were really suffering um, as they were trying to work from home. So yes, it has definitely um, opened the eyes of, of a lot of people. Um, so I think it's, it's there's going to be continuing growing demand, I'm sure, for this sort of um, work. Yeah, they, I've definitely had a number of clients contact me for those reasons. They're saying, look, we knew the house wasn't very good, but we used to head off to work every day, so it didn't matter. But now it does. Yeah. And, the, you know, the, and the energy bills, they really are seeing that in their energy bills. Their boss isn't paying for it anymore. It's them. Yeah. Well, last question. This one's from Kat. And so Kat has recently had to upgrade a hot water system. Uh, she was, at that time, unable to convince her husband about a heat pump, as he argued that they aren't as reliable and don't have as much longevity and as an instantaneous hot water, especially in Melbourne. Um, this was supported by others he spoke to in the industry. And she asks, what is the truth behind this? And can I convince him the next time it comes up? And how can I, sorry, how can I convince him the next time it comes up? You should get at least 10 years out of a good quality heat pump hot water. Um, heat pump hot water systems earn what are called STCs. They're the same renewable energy credits as solar panels earn. And um, just like with solar panels, there's a deemed life, you know, the, the, that energy is that those credits are awarded based upon a, an, an assumed life. With solar panels, the assumed life is 15 years. With heat pump up water, the assumed life is 10 years. So, um, yeah, I, I, I recently um, replaced my uh, heat pump up water and it lasted 11 years. The... Um a couple other points I can think of. Um, one, one of the big advantages, of course, to getting your home off gas is you're off completely and then you don't have to pay the, uh, the fixed charges to be connected to the gas, which is hundreds of dollars per year. Um, so if like your hot water is the last thing that's on the gas, well then that's a, a good incentive. 
with respect to showers, of course, you should have a really good shower head. And so seven liters a minute uh, of water or less. And, and in that case, you're not using so much gas anyway in that situation. But I had a client the other day, um, they found out that the gas pipe under their house was, was corroded and leaky. And so that would have to be place, uh, replaced at a huge expense. So for that reason, they were going to make the decision to give, give up on the gas hot water. And last thing I'll throw in, there are a lot of misconceptions about heat pumps not working in cold climates. They do work in cold climates. They yep. work just fine here in Canberra at, you know, where it gets to minus eight. Um, and not all brands. Uh, you do need to check that the um, brand is suitable for a cold climate. And also a big misconception about them being very noisy. Again, the good ones, um, the newer models are actually very, very quiet. I have one right outside my bedroom window. Not that, it, and it's programmed to only run during the day now, but it wasn't uh, initially. It would come on occasionally at night and I hardly could hear it. I reckon it's a wrap. Um, I, I, I guess, um, I mean, if any of you, I don't know if you want to, I don't know, hang out longer or something with the three of you getting, you know, being here for the first time all together or any wrap up questions that any of you want to add before I um, um, thank those that we need to and um, tell people where to go next for information, things like that. I just say thanks, Kalia and Katie for helping out. Absolutely. We couldn't have done it without you. That's right. I'm sure it would have come apart at the scene. <laughs> <laughs> and I would put it, um, Tim and Richard and I have met in person before. We certainly, we didn't get together last year. Um, but we haven't done a presentation together before. So, yeah, this is really nice. Yeah, fantastic. Well, thank you all. And thanks for everything you've shared today. And I'm just going to hit um, post on this on the Facebook group so that if you haven't joined already, you can. Um, and, yeah, thank you to everybody for your presentations. Thank you to everyone for being here and joining tonight's webinar. And um, thank you, particularly if you submitted a question. I think I tried to get to all of them, um, but you can put your question on the, the Facebook group, my official electric home Facebook group, if we've missed it, um, please do that. And, and that's what it's all about. Um, there's so much information to digest uh, and there's been such you know, fantastic insights from everybody. If you came in late tonight, the good news is that you'll be able to watch the whole thing again online. It will be available on YouTube um, and watch the My Efficient um, Electric home Facebook group uh, for the link to that when that's available in the in the coming days. Um, there's many other events as part of the Sustainable Living Festival, so I urge you to have a look at those. Um, thanks to Katie behind the scenes, Katie Daly. Thanks also to Rosalie from the Sustainable Living Festival for everything they've done to make this possible. Thanks, of course, to Tim Forsey, Home Comfort and Energy Advisor, Jenny Edwards, Building Scientist with Lighthouse Architecture and Science, Richard Keach, uh, a consultant, engineer and author of the Energy Freedom Home and um, I think that's I think that's a wrap. My name's Kalia. It's been awesome being part of this event tonight and yeah I hope you all have a really wonderful evening. See you. Good night. Thanks.